Uh, so I'm pleased to uh, turn it over to Keenan Weller, who's the co-founder of Live, Work, Play, an association in, uh, based in Ottawa that provides support to people with developmental disabilities. Keenan. So I hope I can uh, bring that to everyone today. I'm not going to say uh, much about myself uh, or about my agency, Live, Work, Play, other than to share with you that in light of Canada's ratification of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2010, our organization worked with our members to revise our mission, vision, and values. In 2011, we arrived at a new set of guiding statements, including this core value, People with intellectual disabilities are valuable contributors to the diversity of our communities and to the entire human family. It is with this value in mind that I share the following comments. I'm here today to give voice to concerns about assisted death as it relates to the experience of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This includes those with Down syndrome, autism spectrum disorders, and many other diagnoses, but in particular with dual diagnosis which occurs when an individual with an intellectual disability is also impacted by a mental health issue. I have been honored and challenged over the past 25 years with access to the most intimate thoughts and fears of hundreds of individuals with intellectual disabilities and their family members. We've had the opportunity to help many of them move into a home of their own, get their first job, and find places in community where they can use their talents and build their network of relationships and friends. This is rewarding work in that in demonstrating positive outcomes, we're able to influence the wider public understanding of the capabilities and the value that people with intellectual disabilities bring to our communities. What people do hear less about is the time spent traveling to and from hospitals after hours, days, or weeks of frantic distress calls, or in some instances, we're responding to a call from the police or a paramedic. Sometimes these calls are with regard to a physical injury, but most often it's because an individual has suffered a serious mental health crisis. I would have preferred that one or more of these individuals represent themselves here today, but the fact they're unable to do so is part of the reason why we must not tread lightly into the dangerous territory of terminating lives for reasons other than a foreseeable natural death. They cannot be here because it is too traumatic for them to talk publicly about their despair and the idea that they may not be alive today if someone had been authorized to carry out their wish to be dead. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a legislator. I've walked with people through difficult times in their lives and I've witnessed the devastating impact of extreme, extreme despair and the impossibility of rational decision making for individuals who are experiencing prolonged emotional dysregulation. They become mentally and physically exhausted, which combined with ever increasing social isolation results in unbearable hopelessness. What I have also witnessed time and time again is the wonder of human resilience. I've seen unbelievably dedicated family members and frontline professionals simply refuse to give up, to patiently support incremental progress, often with severe ups and downs. Witnessed the remarkable journey of individuals who had seemingly given up all hope. Through words, actions, or a combination of the two, their desire was expressed in a convincing and consistent fashion, sometimes over the course of weeks, months, or even years, that they did not want to live. The point is, they emerged from that despair because the opportunity to experience life in a different way was still there, and that opportunity was never taken away from them. Simply put, a person is in despair until they are not in despair. I firmly believe the loss of hope is not a condition to be addressed through the termination of lives. Our collective responsibility is not to relieve them of their life, to end their despair or our own discomfort. I mention the discomfort of society because we must confront the reality that people with dual diagnosis often make us very uncomfortable. Our hospitals are under constant pressure to free up beds for other patients. Outside of the hospital environment, community agencies face levels of risk and the potential for public relations disasters at the same time as they're often challenged by lack of capacity and resources. And so, Individuals already in despair and bounce between emergency rooms, psychiatric wards, and various forms of emergency housing and services. Responding to these challenging needs is something that we as Canadian society are only starting to learn how to do well. Very few of our medical or mental health professionals have the training or experience in supporting people with intellectual disabilities. Here in Ontario, it was only in 2009 we finally closed the doors on the last of our mass institutions. People used to live out their lives totally isolated from their own communities, in many cases suffering severe and prolonged abuse. They lived and died, and few people ever even knew their names, let alone the suffering they endured. 
We did the right thing. We did the right thing to close those institutions, but we're still learning how to support people differently. We're still learn, learning how to help them build social capital and develop natural relationships fundamental to all of our physical and mental health. I've dedicated all, all of my adult life to building local community capacity, and I'll be the first to acknowledge many failures along the way. At the same time, also learn we must never give up, and that giving up cannot be an option. I witnessed time and time again individuals emerge from a state of total despair, have achieved stability, and have gone on to flourish. They're living in our neighborhoods, contributing to our economy as workers, bringing value to others through meaningful relationships. If you encounter them today, you'll have no idea they were once asking to die. Please think carefully what it would have meant to have ended those lives. And that's my simple message. Helping such a person to die is not an option now and must not become an option in the future. We cannot turn feelings of hopelessness expressed over solutions that have yet to be found into an excuse to stop trying to find the solutions. We will instead invest in prevention. We will build community capacity. We will learn how to more effectively support individuals with intellectual disabilities and dual diagnosis so they do not become isolated and hopeless. We will also invest in new ways of responding to mental health crises with treatments that relieve rather than promote isolation and with new forms of collaboration between community agencies, the medical community, and psychiatric services. These changes are already occurring. We must therefore find within us as individuals, as parliamentarians, and as Canadians, the loving patience required to provide more effective support to people in need, rather than offer death to solve our own discomfort with the struggle to find the right solutions. Please remember, people are in despair until they are not in despair. It is our collective responsibility to help them find a way forward. With respect to Bill C-14, please don't put giving up hope on our menu of treatment options. Please choose to support patience and love as the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keenan. Thank you for the work you do, and thank you for never giving up on working to build inclusive, uh, an inclusive community in Ottawa and across the country. And I think we all just wish that parliamentarians could launch uh, a nas the, the, the kind of national debate uh, and focused attention on the issues of what it takes to build inclusive communities as they have uh, launched on medical assistance in dying.